Okay, chemists, we are going to start looking at the reactions of alkenes and alkynes, which we'll see are very versatile functional groups, and they are going to open up our arsenal of reactions quite a bit more than any other functional group we've talked about so far. In this first lesson, we're just going to review the couple of ways that we already know to make alkenes. How do you make an alkene from something else? And so far, we only have two ways, the first of which is an E2 reaction, also called a dehydrohalogenation reaction, and it starts with an, an alkyl halide. So if I had, let's say, bromocyclopentane, something like that, I could treat this with a strong base, let's say methoxide, sodium methoxide, potassium methoxide, whatever, and it will take away a beta hydrogen We've seen plenty in previous units. That's your arrow pushing, concerted mechanism, the E2 reaction, and you get an alkene. And I'm just gonna list the key features of the E2 reaction that you should definitely be familiar with. Writing that one example should highlight a number of things. I mean, number one, what we're using, a halide and a strong base. Uh, number two, this is concerted. The E2 is concerted. It happens all in one step. There's no intermediates to draw. Uh, you normally get the Zaitsev alkene, and just saying that should conjure memories of, oh, how do I get the non-Zaitsev? Well, I would have to use a bulkier base, things like that. Uh, so those are things we can control. And there is a requirement for the leaving group and the, anti and the hydrogen that's beta to be anti-periplanar. In other words, they should be pointing in opposite directions, specifically when, let's say, they're on a ring. So that's one way to make a alkene. The second way is called a dehydration. This is an E1 mechanism, or an application of an E1. This is also called a condensation because you're losing water. And it involves an alcohol with acid, strong acid. So if I had cyclopentanol, I could get cyclopentene, the same product. This is not concerted. Uh, this is a stepwise reaction. It involves carbocations, as we're about to see. We'll do the mechanism. Uh, that means rearrangements can occur. So I'm just going to write the word rearrangements. So we can watch out for those, the same kind of rearrangements we saw in all examples of SN1 and E1 mechanisms. This is an E1 mechanism. Uh, it's usually driven by heat. So you might just see the symbol that's a triangle, meaning the Greek letter delta, meaning thermal. Uh, and you usually do get the Zaitsev product. So how does this work mechanistically? Well, the first step is protonation of the OH group. So draw an arrow from that OH to the H plus. That will give you an intermediate that's a protonated alcohol. So I have OH2 with a positive charge. Now that turned a bad leaving group into a great leaving group, that great leaving group will leave. So draw an arrow showing the water molecule leaving. That gives you a carbocation. This particular cation doesn't have a whole lot of rearrangement pathways for it, so I'm not even going to show them in this, but we'll get to that in a second. And it's that carbocation that turns into the alkene, the water molecule that just left you could actually use as a weak base. It'll take away one of the beta hydrogens in a separate step. That CH bond will break, and that's how you get your pi bond and form your alkene. So those are the two main ways that we know to make alkenes from alkyl halides and from alcohols, functional groups that we also know how to make a little bit of. Uh, so let's use this as an opportunity to review carbocation rearrangements. Since we just brought that up, let's look at an example of how we're doing a dehydration with strong acid and heat, and we actually have a mixture of products, and the goal of this is to explain how they formed. It's not that I would predict us to be able to identify that these are what you get, but to explain this with an arrow pushing mechanism. So you could treat sulfuric acid as just an equivalent of H+, that's a strong acid. So the alcohol will protonate. You get a first step that looks just like the example we had up above. I turn my OH into a leaving group, and 
it leaves, there's no question that that's the very beginning of this mechanism, no matter which intermediate we're trying to explain, you get a cation. Specifically, this secondary carbocation. Now I need to try to explain products A, products B, and products C above. Well, I can get to A directly. A is the Zaitsev product from elimination of that beta hydrogen. I can use the water that just left, take that CH bond to become a pi bond, and you get product A. So what I'd like you to do is to hit pause for a second and see if you can figure out what arrow pushing would be involved to turn this same carbocation intermediate except into products B and then separately into products C. How do we get those others? Okay, let's see how you did. I'm going to redraw that same carbocation. This is the only cation you can get in the beginning of this mechanism, this secondary cation. To get product B, it's actually not that complicated. Product B is just the non zaitsev That's removal from one of the beta hydrogens where they're more abundant. Draw an arrow from the water to the H, the CH bond breaks, and you form your pi bond. And there's product B. So that just leaves C. C also has to come from the same carbocation, initially at least. And C has an alkene out here. I can't get to that directly. I've got to get that plus charge somewhere else. That means I'm going to undergo a carbocation rearrangement. This will be a hydride shift, which I'll just write as H shift. An H shift, a hydride shift, means I have a neighboring hydrogen atom, the bond breaks, so that CH bond breaks, and the electrons carry that hydrogen over one atom, they take the hydrogen with it, and as a result, the plus charge has moved, and we went from secondary, which is okay, to tertiary, which is great. There's always going to be a good explanation for why you see a carbocation rearrangement. They never get less stable, they always get better. Uh, in the course of the mechanism. And in addition, it explains the formation of the product. So now, how do I get to product C? Well, here, I'm going to take away one of these beta hydrogens on this methyl CH bond breaks. You form your pi bond. And you get an exocyclic methylene, and that's product C. Obviously, from here, you could also draw an arrow pushing step that creates product A. Uh, that would be removal of one of these beta hydrogens after the hydride shift. So there's sometimes more than one mechanistic pathway that gets you to the same product. Okay, so those are the two ways that we know to make alkenes. I'll just close with one other method, and I'm going to squeeze it in up next to the dehydration reaction that we saw, just because there are other reagents that do this. Most of the time, we don't actually use strong acid when we're trying to dehydrate an alcohol. Chemists have developed specific reagents that do this, I'm not going to show the mechanism for this, but I'm just going to add an alternative reagent for this because you'll see it quite a bit. But it does the same transformation. It's a phosphorus-based reagent, and it looks like POCl3. The mechanism is different. You do form a leaving group, so to speak, between the reaction of that phosphorus reagent and the alcohol, uh, but it involves some chemistry that's related to Orgo 2 stuff. So I'm, I'm just going to put that there as an alternative reaction that you will see as we do this in synthesis examples. Okay, so that's how you make alkenes, and then just a quick refresher of some carbocation rearrangements.